Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman, who was about to give birth, so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and his throne. Just imagine this scene. There is a woman who glows like the sun, a supernatural character, a queen with a crown of 12 stars outshining everything else. But this breathtaking creature is not a model striding up and down the catwalk. She's crying out in pain. She's giving birth to a child. I've never seen anything more dramatic in my life than the last minutes of childbirth. Screaming and pain, blood and struggle. I had never seen my wife like that. And as if this situation was not difficult enough, there is a monster standing next to her. Instead of a midwife, there's a monster, a brutal monster, an enormous dragon waiting in front of the woman in order to devour the child the moment he is born. What a nightmare. What producer, what visual effects specialist could create a more dreadful monster? I don't know what's more terrible. The red skin? The tail which sweeps the stars out of the sky? The, the seven heads? What do these images want to tell us? Where do they come from? What are they meant to remind us of? I once played a game with some friends. You got a stack of cards with a word on each of them. The goal was to describe the term on the card to your team without using the word itself. However, each card also contained a list of obvious words, which also had to be omitted in the description. In my group, there were two girls who were extremely good at this game. They seemed to be good friends and had developed their own language. For example, when they had to guess the name of a famous singer, they did not have to use words such as singer, actress, or the title of a film or song for their description. In fact, they were not allowed to use these words. Within seconds, the girls identified the star by her oversized, at least in their view, buttocks. Maybe they had already ridiculed this singer often and now one hint was enough to identify her immediately. Personally, I would not have guessed the person in question because I was not part of their clique. We are in a similar situation as these girls. It doesn't matter whether we are surrounded by friends, colleagues or our fellow countrymen. The common experiences of that group have shaped its language. People who are not part of our community do not always understand what we are talking about. Insiders, however, sometimes only need one word to understand everything. The authors of the Bible also had a common cultural background. John was a Jew, and that's why God used images John was familiar with. Now, for us, this means that in order to understand the book of Revelation, we have to have knowledge of the Bible, and in this case, the Old Testament. That's the part of the Bible that was available to the Jews and Christians in those days. The language in the book of Revelation is full of words and images taken from the Old Testament. These images evoke certain associations in a way similar to the game played by the two girls.
There is this dragon standing in front of the woman. What was John immediately reminded of by this image? In verse 9, John himself calls the dragon the old serpent who leads the whole world astray. And the illusion is obvious. It was reminded of a previous situation where a woman and a serpent stood face to face. It takes us from the very last book of the Bible to the first one, from the end of the story to its beginnings. The book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and the book of Revelation gives us the overarching theme of the Bible. In the third chapter of the first book, we find the setting which appeared in his mind's eye when John saw the dragon in front of the woman, the Garden of Eden. The serpent asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Huh. Don't touch it or you will die. You're by no means going to die. You are going to die. You're not going to die. Excuse me, who's right? Can it be possible that somebody is lying? We are well acquainted with such conflicts. We live in a world where deception and lying is quite normal. We are lied to several times a day. But Eve, the first woman, is overcome in the conversation with the serpent who pretends to want to help her. Until then, her life had been easy, clear, straightforward, absolutely in harmony. Originally, Eve had something we don't know complete confidence. She knew God personally. They spoke with each other. They touched each other. But Eve didn't know this stranger, the serpent. Actually, the scene at the tree could have gone very simply. God, he's created us and everything else. He knows everything. He's able to do everything and loves us more than anything else. He has good reason to warn us. But this is exactly where the serpent begins this argument. God has forbidden something. Why? The serpent has an answer, yes indeed, it pretends to know that God doesn't say the truth, but also knows the reason why. No, he is not mistaken. God knows that you are not going to die. He lied to you intentionally. He wanted to scare you, he wants you to remain stupid, insignificant and dependent, so that you never want to be wiser, mightier and become independent. What a surprise. This snake's short description gives you a totally different image of God. A single thought leads you away from a father who would do everything for you to somebody who suppresses you and manipulates you. Why does Eve finally take the fruit? Out of hunger? Out of boredom? No. The words of the serpent are a strong accusation against God. She hesitates but for a short moment, and there it is, a fine crack, a small gap, this millimetre of mistrust. Unbelievable. And this was sufficient for such a momentous decision? Yes, it was.
The result was a chain reaction in her mind similar to the breaking of a dam. In May 1943, the Mohn Reservoir in North Rhine-Westphalia, Germany, was bombed by the British. At that time of the year, the reservoir was full to the gunwales. One bomb detonation at a depth of 15 meters was sufficient. A tiny crack appeared in the wall of the huge dam, but the pressure of the spilling water quickly widened the crack. Finally, there was a broad gap through which huge amounts of water ran. 1,600 people died in this flood, although they lived up to 100 kilometers away from the dam. Mistrust also gains an eerie momentum. Try the mere thought, maybe he or she is deceiving me. It's not easy to get rid of that thought. The serpent knew that, it knew from its own experience. In order to express such doubts, the serpent itself must have had them first. In fact, it was nothing more than its own poisonous problem, which it now offered to humans like a sweet fruit. The serpent was the first one to mistrust God. It could no longer rely on God the Father. The serpent didn't want to take him at his word, and the first human it saw was infected with this virus. The consequences were a catastrophe. The fruit was not poisoned, however the relationship between humans and God was poisoned from that moment onward. Thousands of years of world history has passed since. Which nation, which culture, which religion has returned to a faithful relationship with God as it existed in the Garden of Eden? Isn't the opposite the case? Numerous distorted images of God have been developed over the course of time. Dozens of cruel cults, oppressive rites and mindless exercises. It's not surprising that people in the Western world have liberated themselves from this burden called religion and do not trust anybody anymore. Trusting in God? Are you kidding? So this is the story of the dragon. A story about mistrusting God. As the serpent, it assumed the role of a friend, flattering the humans, but in the book of Revelation, it shows its real face. If it could, it would sweep every star out of the sky. It would also use every possible means to tear humans away from God, but why? What have we done to it? Some time ago I read the story about the McGregor family. The McGregors were a couple who had a small son. One day, mother and son disappeared without leaving any trace. There had been no accident and they were not kidnapped or killed. The woman betrayed her husband. Nobody knows why, she never confessed her reasons. Finally, she despised her husband so much, she just wanted to leave him in order to start a new life somewhere else. But her son became older and began to ask about his father. What should her answer be? Should she tell him what she had done? No, she wanted the boy to think that his father was mean and indifferent, that he betrayed and left her. So she told him exactly this again and again. The boy grew up without a father. Even worse, he grew up with a horrible picture of a father with whom he wouldn't want to have any contact. Everything he knew about his father was a burden to him. On the other hand, his mother was now content. Her son was never going to want to meet his father and would therefore not know the truth.
Now, you might think, if she has a problem with her ex-husband, why does she involve her son? But this is the way it was in the beginning. The serpent has nothing against Eve. The dragon does not fight primarily against the pregnant woman. His enemy is God. His fight against God began before humans were created. We were later drawn into the conflict, like Mrs. McGregor's son. And the consequences for us are similar. Humanity finds itself fatherless. He cannot be seen, he is far away from us, and nobody knows what he really thinks. A life without trust in him is more than burdening. I, for example, managed quite well in this life. Although I've gone through some personal crises, I grew up. Today I'm an adult. I like my job, I've earned money, I'm married, I have a daughter. I carry so much responsibility that I could be proud, but deep within my heart, sometimes when I'm honest to myself, I know that I'm overburdened. I feel alone in my role as a father. How can I fulfill this awesome obligation to my daughter? So many decisions have to be made, right decisions. Sometimes I don't know what is best. Sometimes I don't even have the strength to make a decision. Do you know what I would need most? Someone to tell me again and again that I really do a lot and that even though I fail, which is quite often, I'm infinitely valuable. Now this sounds like a child who misses his father. Right, that's, that's the case. In fact, this was never the plan. We were not supposed to grow up without a father. Yes, I want to be independent, but I miss him. I, I want to rely on him, but this is not easy because of the serpent. I am a man. I have a drill, a hammer drill. I manage by myself. I am strong. Well, I have to be strong whether I want to be or not. There is no one to take care of me anymore. Now, of course, this isn't ideal. If it would be, I wouldn't have to protect myself. If I were strong, not because life would otherwise not be down, but because security and self-confidence would develop in me. Because I could exercise and grow in peace because I have a mentor who's by my side and knows me and loves me and still doesn't take advantage of that. But this kind of life was stolen from us. The dragon sowed the seeds of mistrust and mistrust now determines our daily life. We have learned to live separately from God and we manage more or less. But does it have to remain like this? Did the McGregor's son accept his life as it was or did he ever learn the truth? about his father.